Now it's our Miss Brooks starring Eve Arden. women are both interested in the same man, there is bound to be a certain amount of friction between them. But it can be said truthfully that in their rivalry over Mr. Poynton, our Miss Brooks, who teaches English at Madison High, and Daisy Enright have never engaged in any cutthroat competition. No, indeed. We could never get the knives out of each other's backs in time. <laughs> but although our competition in the past has been rather intense, last Wednesday I received some wonderful news. Miss Enright was about to leave school to marry someone else, thus leaving me a clear field with Mr. Boynton. As I waited at the bus stop for my bus to school Thursday morning, I was in such excellent spirits I could barely contain my enthusiasm. Oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what a wonderful day. Da -da 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 -da. Oh, good morning, driver. A good, good morning to you. <laughs> Hi, have you ever seen such a beautiful morning? Cold and crisp and yet absolutely clear, amazingly clear. Just look at that sunshine, look at it. <laughs> have you ever seen the sun so bright this early in the morning? So glisteningly, brilliantly, beautifully bright. Have you ever seen it so bright? <laughs> 10 cents, please. <laughs> morning that makes you glad to be alive. <laughs> glad you can see and hear and feel. Birds chirping, air tingling, sun shining. Honestly, have you ever seen such a day? Ten cents, please. <laughs> and lady, you see that sign up there? Please do not converse with driver while bus is in motion. Yes, I see it. Good. Then would you mind stopping the bus so we can chat? <laughs> You know, I wouldn't be talking to you like this, but the most wonderful thing happened to a friend of mine. You see, she teaches school, and she and some other teacher were competing for the same fellow. Now, the other teacher finally saw she didn't have a chance, so she joined an introduction club, corresponded with a man, and now she's getting married, thus leaving the field open for the first teacher. Isn't that wonderful? Ten cents, please. <laughs> You haven't heard the end. Lady, lady, I saw the whole story on television last night. <laughs> and if you can keep a secret, I'm the first teacher. If you haven't got a dime, I'll lend it to you. Oh, no, I, I've got the money. <laughs> the bus driver wants his fare, and the bus driver will get his fare. Here we are, the bus fare for the bus driver. The happy little driver gets his little fare. <laughs> <laughs> and to think I turned down a chance to become a ditch digger. <laughs> There we are. Ten pennies. Lady, come back here. You made a mistake. You gave me 11 pennies. Easy come, easy go. <laughs> Today, you can keep the change. Why is Miss Enright doing this to me? Why is she leaving me? Why, Harriet? Why? <laughs> Daddy. That's the poorest excuse I've ever <laughs> Imagine Miss Enright using an introduction club to correspond with some out-of-town idiot, when right here on my own faculty there are enough idiots to teach us. But that's just it, Daddy. She chose Mr. Boynton years ago, but he never gave her a tumble. How could he, when Miss Brooks has always had her big feet out whenever he passed? <laughs> But this morning, this morning, I'm going to see what I can do about that. If Miss Brooks could be persuaded to give up her bashful biologist for a few weeks, then Miss Enright might... <gasps> Daddy, you wouldn't interfere in the personal life of your teachers. Oh, wouldn't I, though? <laughs> now, if you'll excuse me, Harriet, I believe I see my pigeon... Uh, Miss Brooks, come up the wall. <laughs> to my inner office, please. Oh, all right. Now she's walking up the front steps. Now she's approaching the front door. Now she's coming toward my office. Good morning, Miss Brooks. A good, good morning to you, sir. Follow me into my office, please. Yes, sir, after you. Right after you. Right into your office. Why, well, you're looking well this morning, Mr. Conklin. 
Healthy, robust, clear-eyed, well-rested. I don't think I've ever seen you looking better, sir. No, sir, never better. Oh, I've seen you looking well before, but never brimming with the marvelous health you're brimming with this morning. Go sit down. <laughs> That's better than 10 cents, please. <laughs> yes, sir. I'll come directly to the point, Miss Brooks. You are no doubt aware of the grave shortage of good teachers at the present time and the great difficulty in securing a new one when one is lost. Now, we don't want to lose Miss Enright, do we? Who doesn't? <laughs> I doesn't. <laughs> I feel sure that if greater interest were displayed in her by a certain male member of my faculty, Miss Enright might consider remaining. How do you know that? She told me. Now, if you would be willing to step aside for three or four weeks, I'm sure that this... Sir, I most emphatically will not. I think this is a most unfair request, a distinct infringement on my personal life, and I think you're overstepping your authority in asking me to do it. So you do. <laughs> Miss Brooks, may I remind you that I have your application to teach at night school, an application which only requires my signature to put you out of circulation every night for the remainder of this semester. But, sir, that application is six years old, made before I met Mr. Boynton. Why, it's covered with dust by now. I'll buy a new dust cloth in your honor. <laughs> All right, sir, I'll do as you ask. Well, will you tell Miss Enright, or shall I? Neither one of us need bother. But how will she know? I told her 15 minutes ago. <laughs> All right, class dismissed. get out that fast. The room isn't infected, you know. Oh, there you are. Good morning, dear, dear Miss Brooks. Now it is. <laughs> good morning, Miss Enright. I came in to thank you for stepping aside and being the good sport you usually aren't. Oh, you needn't thank me. It was Mr. Conklin's idea to prevent you from leaving Madison. Oh, but darling, I never had any intention of leaving Madison. Huh? <laughs> no, this was just a little plan of mine to have dear Mr. Boynton all to myself for a few weeks. I knew exactly how Mr. Conklin would react when I threatened to resign to get married. Then you didn't correspond with anyone through that introduction club. Oh, yes, but I did, darling. I carried on quite a lengthy and amorous correspondence with a fellow named Victor Cummings, a businessman from Attleboro, Massachusetts. Matter of fact, he's due in on the noon train. The noon train? Well, that ought to give you plenty of time to get married before your date with Mr. Boynton tonight. What are you going to do about this fellow Cummings? Aren't you worried? I worried? Why should I be worried, darling? Oh, oh, that's right. I neglected to tell you. I carried on the correspondence in your name. Oh. My name? Yes. But I'm certain it was the enclosed snapshot of you that induced him to come out to get married. It was quite a neat bit of trick photography. I superimposed your head on Jane Russell's body. I see. Well, even if I didn't object to the marriage, I'm sure Mr. Cummings would. But why, darling? By the time he married the girl in that photograph, he'd be arrested for bigamy. <laughs> now, Miss Enright and I had campaigned for Mr. Boynton in the usual accepted, unladylike manner. But her latest trick of sending my name, address, and photograph to some Lonely Hearts businessman in Attleboro, Massachusetts was a low blow of the foulest order. And I was terribly unhappy that I hadn't thought of it first. However, at noon, when I saw Mr. Boynton approaching our table in the school cafeteria, I decided I'd better keep my promise to Mr. Conklin and temporarily break off our relationship. But I determined to do it gently and with finesse. Hello, Miss Brooks. Goodbye, Mr. Boynton. <laughs> I'm afraid I'll have to postpone our date for tonight. 
But, Miss Brooks, you have our ballet tickets for tonight, and we've been looking forward to it for a month. Well, I'm sorry, but I feel a nasty cold coming on, and I wouldn't want you to catch it. Oh, well, you needn't worry about that. I never get too close to you. Well, don't rub it in. <laughs> but I'm afraid we'd better forget about tonight. Hi, Mr. Just... Boynton. Boy, Miss Brooks, have I got a bulletin for you. What is it, Walter? Well, I was taking the calls in Mr. Conklin's office just now, and this phone message came in for you. Your fiancé, Harry Gibbons, has arrived from Scranton, Pennsylvania. <laughs> Harry Gibbons from Scranton, Pennsylvania? Then there is someone else. There are two someone else's. <laughs> I don't know anyone from Scranton, Pennsylvania. Well, he certainly seemed to know you. He said, he said to tell you, Hairbreath Harry is here to marry his cuddly Connie. <laughs> Cuddly Connie. Well, I never. Well, maybe you should have. <laughs> oh, believe me, Mr. Boynton, there must be some mistake. I don't know anyone from Scranton, Pennsylvania. The only fiancé I'm expecting is from Attleboro, Massachusetts. What am I saying? Oh, so Miss Enright wasn't the only one to make use of that introduction club. Mr. Boynton, she's the one who wrote to these men, and then she... Oh, here you are, dear. I'm glad I found you. Why, Mrs. Davis, what is it? Well, I told him you'd be home after three, Connie, but he's getting terribly impatient. Who's getting impatient? Your fiancé, Wilbur Davenport, from Oshkosh, Wisconsin. <laughs> Oshkosh, Wisconsin? But I wouldn't marry him if I were you, dear. Personally, I like that tall, strong cattleman from Austin, Texas. <laughs> He's a real pulse stopper. <laughs> oh, goodness. That's terrible. <laughs> Mr. Boynton, why don't you go back with Mrs. Davis and help her get rid of that Shriners convention? <laughs> no, I will not, Miss Brooks. But may I say, I wish you the best of luck and happiness wherever you are. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'll be going. Oh, please, Mr. Boynton, wait. No, oh, I am sorry if I've upset you, dear. This whole thing must be a terrible strain. Perhaps you better ask Mr. Conklin to excuse you for the rest of the day so you can come home and relax. Oh, I can think of a better place than that to relax in, Mrs. Davis. Where, Connie? Walter. See what they can give me at the YMCA. <laughs> right, step into the bus, please. I right, watch your doors. Ah, say, you're the happy little lady from this morning. You know, you were feeling so good that it turned out to be contagious, and I've been whistling and singing ever since. Yes, ma'am, whistling and singing, and it's all because of your happy, sunny disposition. Yes, ma'am, all because of you. I hate Gabby bus drivers. <laughs> Can you change this quarter, please? Maybe I could give you some free advice. All right, Mr. Anthony, solve this one if you can. Two girls are interested in the same man. Girl A sends girl B's name, address, and photograph to a number of out-of-town bachelors. They all arrive. One of them, a big strapping Texan, wipes out the opposition. Now, girl B is stuck with the problem of getting rid of this unwanted suitor. Crazy, huh? Can't happen, huh? Who said? I told you I saw the whole thing last night on television. <laughs> it wasn't on Howdy Doody by any chance. No, no, some comedy show. Now, the blackout is this girl puts on the oldest dress she can find. She acts like she's been sick a hundred years, like she's got a million troubles, and a guy gets so disgusted... Say no more, I get the idea. Pretty crazy stories on television today, huh, lady? <laughs> that stuff could never happen in a million years in real life. No? Pull up a chair outside my window tonight, and you'll find out differently. Ever hear of or read a magazine article called, And Sudden Death? If you do any kind of driving, listen to this quote from the article. If you customarily pass without clear vision a long way ahead, Make sure that everyone with you carries identification papers. It's difficult to identify a body with its whole face bashed in or torn off. 
Don't take chances when you drive. If you have a good head on your shoulders, keep it there. Well, there seemed to be only one sure way to drive my Correspondence Club Romeo back to Texas. That was to look and behave in as ghastly a manner as possible. So that evening, after giving myself the ugly duckling treatment, I stood inspection before my landlady. Well, Mrs. Davis, how do I look? Fine, dear. Simply awful. <laughs> if that potato sack you're wearing doesn't scare off your Texan, then the rest of you should. How did you happen to look so bad? Well, I thought of all the things a girl does to make herself attractive to a man, and then I did them all upside down. But I only hope the rest of my plan works. It certainly should. Just keep talking to him about your ailments. No man wants to marry a sick woman. Well, judging from my experience with Mr. Boynton, no man wants to marry any woman. <laughs> Have you heard from Mr. Boynton or Miss Enright? Yes, dear. They're coming to pick up those ballet tickets. Over my fighting body. If that Texan is as gallant as most Texans, I have an idea that will put Miss Enright... How do you like that? The main Stein song. <laughs> well, here he is, Mrs. Davis. You'd better go inside. All right, dear. Good luck. Howdy, ma'am, I'm... <laughs> Jumping, gee, how's the fat? You are a ma'am, ain't you? How wonderful. You're the first one who's noticed it in a week. Won't you come in? Only please watch the scatter rod. Well, right there. I'm Bill Sadler, travel all the way from Austin, Texas, to claim the hand of the beautiful Constance Brooks. Will you tell your granddaughter I'm here? <laughs> Constance Brooks. <laughs> I told you to watch that scatter rod. Here, let me help you out. Well, no, no, uh, I'm all right, ma'am. Yeah, you're Constance Brooks. If you hurry, there's a bus leaving for Texas at 9.17. Whoa, now, whoa, whoa. Who said anything about leaving? When Bill Sadler makes a bargain, he keeps it. I was afraid you'd see it that way. <laughs> How soon can you be ready to start back with me, Constance? Uh, well, certainly not until after I have my appendix removed. <laughs> oh, got to have an operation, eh? Well, I'm in no hurry. When are you planning to have the appendix out? Right after the scar from my lung operation healed. <laughs> you had a lung operation? But you didn't say nothing about any operations in your letters. Well, since the 1st of November, the doctors have taken out my tonsils, adenoids, one rib, a piece of spine cartilage, a hunk of kneecap, and something in Clause 4, Paragraph 2. Something in Clause 4, Paragraph 2? That's an operation in my hospital insurance contract to which I was entitled, so I took it. <laughs> Nobody loves this. Well, this is a stroke of luck. Luck? You wouldn't believe it to look at me, ma'am, but I've had 27 operations myself. <laughs> 27? Yeah, and no two alike. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm just a surgical fool. Uh -oh. Yes, ma'am, many a long winter night, you and me will sit by my open fireplace and just kick around our operations. <laughs> now, uh, why don't you be a good girl and start packing, huh? But, Mr. Sadler, I feel there's something else you should know. I doubt if my husband would approve. Husband? You... you got you a husband? That's what I got me. <laughs> How come you never mentioned him in your letters? I meant to, but I always seem to run out of ink. I don't get it, ma'am. If you've got you a husband, what for do you want me? That's what I say. <laughs> Actually, Mr. Sadler, I've seen very little of my husband since he began running around with a blonde named Daisy Enright. Oh, so that's how the land lies. Well, sir, there's one thing I can't stand, ma'am. It's a female coming in to bust up a happy home. Why, back in Texas, we tarned fellow woman like that. <laughs> Let's pretend you're back in Texas. I'll see who it is. 
Well, good evening, Miss Enright and Mr. Conklin. Oh, Miss Brooks, what a charming costume. And you've never worn your hair more becomingly. <coughs> then it is Miss Brooks. <laughs> For a moment, I thought it was Nightmare Alley. <laughs> Aren't you going to ask us in, Miss Brooks? Oh, uh, yes, sir. Come in. Is this the vomit, ma'am? <laughs> oh, no, there's been a... Osgood, darling, why did you bring this hussy to our home? Well, you see, Miss Brooks, I found out what Miss Enright had done, and to avoid any further bad feeling between you two, I decided that I would ask, good darling, why did you bring this hussy to our home? Control your temper. I won't call you that if you don't want me to, only don't beat me again. Please don't beat me. You know how easily I bleed. <laughs> Good grief, the woman has finally flipped her lid. <laughs> if she has, you've driven her to it. But you lay a hand on her, partner, and I'll throw your worthless carcass to the coyotes. <laughs> I feel like I've stepped right into the middle of high noon. <laughs> uh, Miss Brooks, just who is this oversized hop-along cat? <laughs> Friend, never mind who I am, but I'll thank you to show a little more respect for your loving wife. <laughs> wife? You have the colossal gall to call that ragged, unkempt, <laughs> moth-eaten creature my wife? Oh, Osgood, then you do still love me. <laughs> oh, now, really, this charade has gone far enough. This woman means absolutely nothing to this man, and I don't see why... You keep out of you. this, Blondie. <laughs> You've been causing enough trouble around this corral. <laughs> Friend, why don't you get wise and promise your little woman you're going to stop chasing around with this young Palomino? Palomino? <laughs> don't you mean old paint? <laughs> well, come to think of it, I might as well take this matter into my own hands. Come on, Blondie, why don't you and me kind of mosey off and leave these people to make up, hmm? You take your hands off me. Well, goodbye, ma'am, and good luck to your appendix. Thanks. Thanks, and many more happy operations to you, too. Uh, I suppose you want me to explain what happened, Mr. Conklin. Either that, or I'm going to have another newsy session with my psychiatrist in the morning. Now, what was that all about? Well, sir, that Texan was so persistent, the only way I could get rid of him was to claim you were my husband. And what better person to get rid of him on than Miss Enright? Well, yes, I suppose that was only common justice after the trick she played on you. I brought her here to straighten matters out. Oh, uh, well, I've had a hard night, Miss Brooks, mostly performing the part of an erring husband. So if you'll excuse me, I... Oh, now, who can that be? Uh, just a moment, sir, while I see who it is. Yes? Oh, good evening. I'm Victor Cummings of Attleboro, Massachusetts. Connie Brooks is expecting me. Would you kindly tell your granddaughter I'm here? Just a moment, please. Oh, Mr. Conklin. Yes, Miss Brooks? Take off your coat. We've got one more performance tonight. <laughs> Eve Harden. After looking the part of my own grandma for a whole evening, it'll be a real pleasure to ditch this rocking chair routine for a little glamour. Well, Miss Brooks, starring Eve Harden, Frank Frog, is produced and directed by Larry Burns, written by Arthur Olsberg and Lou Derman with the music of Lud Gluskin. Mr. Conklin was played by Gail Gordon. <laughs>